Brother Pearson and the music ministry, my goodness, my heart has been filled to overflowing. Uh, worshiping the Lord this morning and thinking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are. If you're not saved, you can get saved this morning and be looking forward to it. But we're sure glad to be here. And I just want to say that I sure appreciate your pastor so very much. Brother Norris has been a friend of mine for a number of years. And I count him as a dear friend in the ministry. And I'm honored that he would ask me to come and fill the pulpit this morning. And uh, I'm sure glad he can get away with his family, get a little time of rest and relaxation. Uh, having pastored for a number of years in a church that was very similar to this in size and scope, I just know the, the pressure of the day-by-day -day ministry. Most people don't realize that. They think a preacher shows up on Sunday and just does a few things and goes home. Uh, but there's a whole lot goes on behind the scenes and a whole lot of pressure that's applied in various aspects of his life. And it's just good to pull away and get some rest and relaxation. So you pray for him as he's away. It's good to see my good friend, Brother Harrison, here, and I'm glad that he's here, still traveling the country with books and trying to encourage folks to be readers. He often says, readers are leaders, and it's vitally important that we have some uh, good things to read. And it's good to see my friend, Brother Bowman, up in the balcony today with his family, thankful for that, and it's a blessing. I remember coming uh, many, many years ago. I was young in the ministry back in the 80s, and we had brought a group down. Our church at that point had come to the Bill Rice Ranch for a couple of years. And for some reason, I was young in the ministry and said, you help, need to help drive the bus. And so uh, we got down there, and I wasn't doing a whole lot. I think we were just uh, dealing with some things. I said, I'm going to go to Franklin Road on Wednesday night. And, of course, back in those days, Dr. Bob Kelly was the pastor. And I sure enjoyed myself that evening. And I thought to myself, if I ever get back in Murfreesboro, I want to be at the Franklin Road Baptist Church, never realizing I get the honor and the privilege of preaching you folks this morning. And so it's my honor to be here. I was preaching uh, several years ago in uh, Wisconsin. It was a cold, snowy morning. I had been there for a couple's retreat, and I walked in on a Sunday morning. It was a smaller church, and as I walked in, the pastor was huddled up with some teenagers in the back part of the building, and you know how pastors are. They just like to have a good time, and so do teenagers, and so, you know, you just never know what they're up to, and so as I'm walking in, they're kind of carrying on and giggling, and the pastor calls me over. He says, I want you to come over, and I, I want you to see this, and one of the young ladies in the church, this was just the, day, the days, uh, just not a couple of years ago, and of course, smartphones, almost everyone was having them in those days, and this young lady had a little bit of technical skill and a little bit of ability with her s cell phone, and so she had made a meme, and on that meme was a cup of coffee, and in that coffee was about 10 of my faces swirling around with the caption, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup, so <laughs> just want to encourage you as you have your coffee. Would you please pray for us and the ministry that God has called us to, Spiritual Leadership Asia. We'll be saying more about that tonight, sharing with you a little bit about the ministry of trying to reach the 1040 window with the gospel. Take your copy of God's Word. And let's go to the book of Hebrews, and then I want you to also find the book of uh, Daniel chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 3. We're going to do our best uh, to say a lot in a short amount of time. I have been known to preach fast. Uh, sometimes too fast, and so I'll do my best to kind of throttle it back a little bit this morning and try to be a help to you. Daniel chapter 11. We know, obviously, that this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is a chapter that deals with the element of faith and how important that is in our Christian life. And as, as we think about faith, we understand that everything about the Christian life really is, is to be done in the realm of faith. Uh, we, we think about the aspect of our Christian life. It starts with faith. Be, a person can be unsaved and believe in God, but, but you, cannot, you, you cannot be saved until you understand what God has done for you and you personally accept that, believing that what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Uh, in other words, all of us in this room should have a testimony of our salvation. Do you remember the day you got saved? Do you remember how God worked in your life? And probably before you were saved, God was working your life in circumstances and doing things uh, preparing you for the fact that at some point someone would come and confront you with the gospel. In my case, I was just a boy, five years old, sitting in the church that I end up pastoring. And, and uh, I remember very distinctly, God had been working my heart for a while, but on that Sunday morning, God rang my bell. And I walked the aisle and knelt in an old-fashioned altar. My dad knelt next to me and opened his uh, King James Schofield Bible and walked me down the Romans Road. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ that day. And God saved my life and changed my life. So it begins with faith. We also understand that faith is an element that is necessary as we walk through this world. 
As we heard this morning, you know, this world isn't really our home. We're just pilgriming through. We're just walking through this world. And one of these days, God's going to pull the plug and we're out of here. And, and he begins his last works. But while we're here, sometimes it's difficult. We're, as was stated this morning, life can be difficult and we have to remember faith. So, so would you notice with me verse number six? The Bible says in verse number six of Hebrews chapter 11, but without faith. So Faith is important, but without faith, what? It is impossible to please God. You can't please God as a Christian unless you walk in faith. So it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Now, none of us has seen God physically. The Bible tells us God is a spirit, and and we know that Jesus, of course, took on flesh. He's God in the flesh, and he'll retain that, that, that aspect of throughout eternity. But I'm just simply saying, nobody here has seen God, but we do believe that he is. We believe because God has helped us to understand that he framed the world by his words and, and, and everything. And so we understand it begins with faith. Look at verse number one. What, what is faith? Well, it tells us here that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so as we look at this, we're, we're told that at times our faith has some tangible aspects to it. In other words, that it, it becomes the point that it's not just something we talk about, but something that we flesh out in the way that we walk and in, in the things that we do and the way we deport ourselves in this particular life. And people should be able to see it. So in every Christian life, the opportunity presents itself for us at points. Can I make this statement to take what I call steps? of bold faith. In other words, God prompts us to, to do something that we wouldn't normally do, but because he's prompting us, because he's guiding us, because he's directing us, we're willing to take some steps of what I call bold faith. So God allows our faith to be tested so that it can become visible and more pure. Here, here's a verse, if you haven't memorized, you may want to jot it down and memorize it. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 7 where Peter talks about faith. And here's a guy, obviously, who learned a little bit about faith in his Christian walk, walking with the Savior. But he says, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire, that it may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So Peter's thought is about gold. He's using this comparative, if, if you would, that Gold is, is very precious, probably of all the minerals and uh, of things. It's probably one of the most precious. It's a very costly min mineral dug out of the ground. Of course, as it's coming out of the ground, it's not pure. It has to go through a process of purification to become more valuable. And so he's kind of using that analogy that sometimes God allows our faith to be kind of put in the crucible, so to speak, of life, and the heat gets turned up. I did a little research on gold purification. My oldest son is a businessman, and he worked for a corporation. They farmed him out for a while and brought him back to the corporate office, but he was up in Buffalo, New York, at a gold refining plant. He was the control of the plant and, and oversaw all the finances, and it was a high-tech place. But my understanding is that when they refine gold, of course, they take that gold ore out of the ground, and they don't just throw the gold into the fire. They put it in a crucible and throw it into the fire, and they turn up the heat. It is so precise, they tell me, that once the, the, the goldsmith begins the process, he never leaves his position. So in other words, he doesn't walk away, he doesn't start the process and walk away and say, I'll come back in 10 minutes and see how we're doing. No, no, he sets by that gold. Why? Because it's costly. And he understands, hey, if, I, if, I, if I'm not careful with this process, I can ruin the product that I'm trying to, to refine. So what does he do? He turns up the heat and that gold begins to liquefy and it, it has to go through this process. And my understanding is that as, it, as it's liquefying, the impurities rise to the surface and the goldsmith will then take them and, and skim that off and throw it to the side and then he'll continue that process. And he understands that in order to, to be completely refined, he can't underdo it and he, if he lets it go too long, he can scorch the gold and ruin it. So this is a very fine window that he's dealing with. And they tell me that the goldsmith knows that that gold is completely refined, that when he looks down in that crucible and can see his face shining back at him with no distortion, that the gold is completely done. Isn't it interesting how Peter uses that analogy that God works on us and sometimes allows us to go through a trial, turning up the heat, so to speak, so that at a point that work is done and 
God can be glorified through our lives. So let me take you to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, where we obviously see that process working in the lives of three young men. And I want us to consider quickly this familiar story this morning where these men face what I call a very, very severe test. Now, now here's, here's the problem with this chapter. If we're not careful, we can sit here like Sunday school kids. And almost in our mind, think about, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as almost cartoon characters. You know, this happened, but it was, you know, and I understand the re reality of it. But I'm telling you, if, as you read this, this, this text, and as you and I walk through it this morning, there's some high drama going on here. There's some extreme pressure being applied, and, and this is not just something that, you know, just skim over. I know that story. No, no, this is a story that you ought to immerse yourself in and, and understand that these folks are going through a very, very difficult time in their life. So let's look at the background here in chapter 3. Look at verses 1 through 7. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura, in the providence of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? The treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication, the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded. So here's the command. This is not a suggestion. This is not a, a good idea. This is not something if you feel like it. No, no, no. This is a command. Then commanded, uh, the, 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 To you is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that ye fall down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now here's the consolation. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth all, uh, shall to the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now we're all familiar with that. At least if you've been in Sunday school, you're familiar with this story. And, and so we, we, we understand what's happening here. But I, do you understand the amount of pressure that's being applied? So as I think about that, Nebuchadnezzar has erected this 90-foot image on the plain of Dura. He's commanded all these leaders, anybody that's anybody in the kingdom that has any position of power has been summoned to this dedication. They're to be there at this particular dedication. Now, I think it's interesting because I think if you go back to chapter 2, you find there's a parallel that's going on here. God had given Nebuchadnezzar a disturbing dream in the second chapter. You may remember that. And he's, he wakes up and he's forgotten the dream, but he's so disturbed by it, he knows that it means something. And so he calls all of his wise men to him and says, hey, somebody's got to tell me what this dream is. And, and they say, well, you tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it means. And he said, no, no, if you know what you're supposed to know, then you ought to be able to tell me what my dream is and then tell me what it's all about. You remember that story. And of course, they're all summoned and, and, and they begin to give excuses. And he said, look, if you don't do it, you're all going to die. And so, you know, they, they begin to scramble. And there's one guy who can give them the answer. And it's Daniel. He seeks God and God tells him about what happened. And of course, in that particular dream in, in Daniel chapter 2, he explains that, there's, that the king had this dream and he saw this image. Now think about this. Again, there's an image in chapter 3. There's an image in chapter 2. The image in chapter 2 speaks of various kingdoms, and so it speaks of an image that had a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet, of, uh, feet that were part iron, part clay. And he watches as this image in his dream is a, a, a stone that is cut without hands, comes and smites the image and scatters it to the wind. And then Daniel speaks up and says, hey, this image is speaking of these kingdoms and your kingdom is the head kingdom. It's the one of gold. And after you will come other kingdoms. And, and there comes a kingdom in the future that's a kingdom that God will put together. It's a kingdom of his son and it's going to be, it's going to smite the images, these kingdoms, and scatter them to the wind and will establish a kingdom that will be an everlasting kingdom. That's basically what he said. Well, the interesting thing is that the king honors Daniel and worships his God. But now here in chapter 3, he's erecting this image. 
And what's the image made of, my brothers and sisters in Christ? It's made of gold. And what was gold representative? It was his kingdom. And so here in the third chapter, it's as if Nebuchadnezzar is full of himself and saying, hey, I know what the dream said, but here's my kingdom, and I want the world to know about my kingdom, and I want you all to worship my gods that I worship because my God has allowed me to have this kingdom, and so you're all going to fall down and worship my particular image. So it's an interesting parallel. So the, Rome, the royal decree goes, and the summons is set out, and all the leaders of the kingdom come to the dedication. Now I want you to understand that this is not a... This is a God moment that's happening, but there's also evil at play here. There's a lot of evil that's happening in this particular realm of this kingdom at this moment. And so as we read here, I sense that there's a demonic and evil fanfare as this mostly heathen crowd gathers for the dedication of this particular golden image, 90 feet tall, on the plain of Dura. Now, according to verses 4 and 5, the herald delivers the message from the king. In just a moment, the the band is going to strike it up, and when it does, everybody bows and everybody falls and everybody worships my gods and my image. And just in case you're inclined not to, verse number six, we have a furnace. Now, I have to ask myself this question. Why did the Nebuchadnezzar feel like he maybe needed to make that statement? Well, because I think he probably understood that there were some Hebrews that served in his cabinet, who had an inclination not to bow to anything but their God. And so he says, just in case you boys don't understand, there is a penalty for disobedience. And so just understand that, because in the moment the music will play. Well, verse number seven, notice what happens. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Let's just say the music. And then they fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So, so they did. Almost all of them did. But as you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's some Hebrew guys who are serving in this particular realm. We learn from Daniel chapter 1 that Daniel and his three friends were taken from Israel when they had that first wave of captivity, when Babylon came down on the judgment of Judah into Jerusalem and carried away the the learned, those that were of the king's seed and those that had the mind to learn. He carried away the best. And Daniel and his three friends were part of that. And and we understand from chapter 2, verses 47 and 48, that these guys were then given an elevated position because they had the ability to to excel. And God had put his hand of blessing on them in this particular kingdom. And so we see that happening. So the Hebrew people were captives and they were still God's people. So being in this heathen kingdom and still worshiping God, and now they face this pressure. Okay, what are we going to do? This guy says that when the music plays, we have to bow. Are we going to bow? Our God says we can't bow. If we're worshiping him, we can't bow to any God or worship anyone other than our God. Are we going to do it? And of course, they don't. So notice there's an accusation in verse number 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came and accused the Jews. Isn't it interesting? Some people are not interested in minding their own business. They were pretty quick. I, got, I get the feeling there were some people that were a little bit jealous of these guys in their elevated position. They're not born here, but they've been elevated, and I, we don't like that, and so we're going to find whatever we can. And so they rush to tell the king that they haven't bowed. And so as a result of that, um, the king is infuriated. In verses 13 through 15, you know, he gives them a test, and he says, okay, guys, maybe you just didn't understand. I'm just going to explain this one more time to you. It really didn't matter. He could have, he could have explained it a hundred times. These guys understood, right? That's, that's the point. They understood. And they said, we're not going to do this no matter what. And I love the fact that their response to the king was so matter of fact. It wasn't disrespectful. They just simply said, look, you, you can do whatever. You can threaten us however you want to. But I've got to tell you that, hey, we believe in our God, and he's able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, I love that. Even if he doesn't deliver us, he is going to deliver us from, from your hand. Amen. That's faith. That's faith in a time of of being tested. So, obviously, we find that they don't succumb and they go through this test. And you know the story how that, you know, they get to this point where they're thrown into the fire. And the king is so aggravated, so agitated at these guys that he says, okay, let's turn the oven up higher than it's ever been before. And 
You know the story. They're bound and they're carried by these most valiant men in the kingdom. And those men who throw them into the fire, of course, are then slain by the heat. The flame comes out and slays the, the, the men who threw them in. And I love the fact that, that the, you get the impression as you're reading this that, hey, everybody in the kingdom, all these guys that have been summoned, they're, they're all excited to see what's going to happen because they want to see these guys destroyed. And so there's the king standing there by the furnace. you got all these, this entourage by the furnace. And they throw those guys in. And what happens? Well, the, the men die that throw them in. But they said, hey, didn't we just throw three guys in? We see a fourth man walking in the midst of the fire and the flame has no hurt on them. And, and, and the fourth is like, don't you love this? Like unto the Son of God. So God is with them in this time of testing and trial as they're facing this difficulty. And of course, obviously, God delivers them. And we find, of course, as a result of that, some great things happen. Look at the end of the chapter. Look, if you would, at verse number 27. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their co coats changed, nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Boy, you talk about insulation. <laughs> God insulated them. Verse number 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God. It's so... Here it is. He's, these men have stood up to the challenge. And now Nebuchadnezzar says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no God that can deliver after this sword. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. Now we know that story. But again, I want, I want you to put yourself in that drama and I want you to think about the pressure of these men as, as this this threat of violence, this threat of death is, is being placed on them, and yet when that threat is really turned up and, it's, and the rubber meets the road, they said, we're going to stand. We, we don't care what you're going to do to us. We will stand, and we believe that our God can deliver us, and even if he doesn't deliver us, that's okay. We have died because for what we believe in, for our faith in the God that we hold true to. Now I want you to go to back to Hebrews chapter 11. Because as you're familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, you'll know as you walk through that chapter, we are introduced to people who flesh out their faith and do great things because of faith, right? Men like, like Noah, building an ark before it's ever rained, has no comprehension of what a, a rain looks like or what a flood looks like, and God tells him to build a boat in a desert. And because he believes God, of course he believes God, and he and his household are saved. Uh, we, are, we are introduced, of course, to Abel, who offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, believing what God had taught about sacrifices. And, and on and on it goes, Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, think, think about them, living in Ur of the Chaldees. And one day God shows up and says, hey, Abraham, sell your house and follow me. Now, understand that Abraham is living in a house. He's living in a, in a home, in an in a, in a established community of high technology. And God shows up and says, I want you to leave all that behind and, and you're, and you're going you're gonna to go. And, and, and so I can just imagine, ladies, you know how this is. Your husband comes home and he says, honey, uh, I have a, have a proposition for you. We're moving. Well, I like my house. All my family's here. Where are we going? Well, I don't rightly know. God said, just follow him. You talk about faith, following God. And, 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 you know, and the Bible says that Abraham left a city, but he went looking for a city whose, have, whose foundation and, and maker was God himself. I'm, I'm just telling you, that this is faith. This is what faith looks like. And so we see it fleshed out and we see good things happen. But I want you to notice, if you would, at the end of the chapter, verse 35, right in the middle. Because faith sometimes is tested and the end result physically doesn't end so well. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Notice that they may obtain a better resurrection. See, that's faith. In other words, I'm going to trust God regardless of how it turns out. 
And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, saying, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. These all having obtained a good report through faith. So I said all that to make some applications this morning. I know you're not living in a bubble, so you'll understand what I'm saying when I say this this morning. As Christians and Americans and people who live in this world, we're seeing some very strange and difficult thing, things happening in our days. In the last couple of years, we've seen hostility and violence and chaos erupt in the streets of our cities. We've seen destruction of both public and private property. We're seeing police and law enforcement personnel being attacked, degraded, targeted, and defunded. People at the highest levels of our government are working hard to instill socialism and communism into our republic. We're seeing a polarization and division in our country like never before. Racial and political tools are being used by wicked people to drive wedges and divide this country like never before. We're watching the youth of our nation as they are indoctrinated with godless progressive secularism through various public venues of education. Do you know the fastest growing dimension spiritually in this country? Do you know what it is? It's called the nuns, not N-U-N-S, no, no. It's N-O-N-E-S. They don't believe in anything. Uh, there is no God. We, we trust in ourselves. We believe in ourselves. They're being indoctrinated. That's who. There is no God. You believe and you trust in yourself. And that indoctrination is taking hold in our country. They have no faith. The biblical foundation of morality and gender is attacked openly, mocked, and ridiculed in our modern world. All this social, moral, and spiritual upheaval can be a little bit disheartening for us as God's people to watch. As Christians, and I don't know if you count yourself, but I am a proud American. I'm proud of this nation, and not in a wrong way. Proud that I'm a part of what God has allowed me to, to live under. And I don't like what I'm seeing and what I sense is happening in our country and world. But listen to me, while I don't like it, the Bible teaches me not to live in fear. I'm to live in faith. I'm to trust God. I'm to believe God, trusting him each and every day. So let me encourage you, in spite of what's going on, God's purposes are being accomplished even in the most difficult of moments. You know, we all want Jesus to come, but have you read what happens before Jesus comes? There's a great falling away. There's a, a wickedness that pervades the culture. And I'm telling you, that I don't have to be fearful of that. I can, I can have faith and trust in what God is doing in this world. God has called his people, think about this, to be salt and light to the very end. We are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in the darkest of moments. We are to play that part in this particular culture. One of God's purposes is for his people of faith to shine as our nation and our world grow darker. Let me illustrate. Perhaps you've heard recently of this school teacher. His name is Tanner Cross. He teaches physical education in a Leesburg Elementary School in Loudoun County, Virginia. And he recently addressed the school board there about the district's requirement that the teachers accommodate the students to, who choose to be identified as another gender rather than what they are biologically. I love the fact that he stated kindly but firmly his faith was in God. And as such, he could not lie to his students no matter what. Therefore, he would not capitulate to this particular demand. And perhaps you read that two days later, he got terminated from his position as a teacher. So here's a man who is facing this pressure. It's being applied to him as a Christian. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to trust my God no matter what. Well, at this point, it hasn't fared so well for him. But I still believe that he's bringing honor and glory to the Lord because of his faith. So here's what I want to say to you this morning, and we're finished. Don't be afraid to be bold in your faith. Don't be afraid to take a stand as God gives you an opportunity. Is it easy to do so in this culture? No, it's not. 
And I'm telling you, you will sometimes feel the demons of hell breathing down your neck in a situation or a circumstance that you may face as a believer. But can I help you understand whether you're in the farthest part of the balcony or sitting right down here in the front row, there is a God in heaven who will help you and get you through that moment. So no matter how dark, just remember God always wins. As the old preacher used to say, I read the back of the book and we win. <laughs> we are on the winning side. No question about that. So it's important that as the people of God that we know what we believe. We should know that. We need to be people of the book. Maybe people walking in the Bible, believing what God has said regardless of what the culture says. But the culture has changed 180 degrees since I was a kid growing up. Man, talk about radical changes. We've seen radical changes in the last couple of years, but Man, from the time I was a kid growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, to, to this day, I mean, there's been a 180-degree turn in the culture. And the culture is constantly changing. But can I tell you something that doesn't change? This Bible. God hasn't changed his mind. He doesn't accommodate cultures. He speaks truth. And as God's people, we are his tools. We are to bring glory to him. We don't bring him glory when we accommodate the culture and just go along with everything the world says. We bring him glory when we stand firm. You don't have to be ugly about it. You don't have to be mean or cantankerous and hateful. You can be kind but firm and take a stand for Jesus Christ in a world that's going crazy. I don't think it's going to be long until he comes. But until he comes, may God find us faithful. Would you bow your heads together with me in prayer today? Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this service. It's my honor to preach to you this morning. Our young people are facing severe tests. And they will face more and more as time goes on in this world in which you and I are living. I'm an older guy. I think I'll be here when Jesus comes because I believe he's coming today. But I may not be. But my children may be, and my grandchildren probably will be. And I need to be praying for them. And so I want to encourage those of us who are of the older generation to be praying for the younger generation. You need to pray for your pastor. You need to pray for your staff. You need to pray for your young people that are coming behind you. Because they're going to be like these three young men in this kingdom. Heathenness is all around them. And the heathens want the people to bow to their gods. And we need to raise up a, young, a group of young people who say, we're just not capitulating. We're not doing it. We're going to believe our God. And can I tell you where that happens? It happens in the church house, but it also happens in your house. And so I'm going to encourage you that our parents today, maybe to make a trip to the altar to pray for your kids and ask God to help you in your home to be the kind of people that will build young people with strong faith. There may be someone here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You may have come to this service this morning, and if you died today, you have no clue whether you're going to be with God in heaven or not. I want to encourage you today that if you're here this morning without Christ as your Savior, that if God has spoken to your heart about the fact that, hey, I need to have faith in the one who died for me, that you make your way here and let a personal worker take a Bible take you aside and share with you out of God's word like I did when I was just a child and opening up God's word and walking you down through the scriptures and showing you what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's where faith begins. It begins with a relationship with Christ. But I'm here to tell you all of us need to have our faith strengthened today. And all of us need to have a determination that we're going to live for Jesus in this world in which we're, 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 uh, we find ourselves. Would you stand together with me for prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, I pray, I pray that as we've spoken this morning, that your spirit has spoken to the hearts. Lord, we're living in a world that has literally lost its, its uh, center. It has no clue of what direction it's going, except it's being led by the wicked one. And Lord, we know that you're allowing this for your purposes, but we are your people and we live here in this world. And so Lord, help us to determine that we want to be salt and light until Jesus comes or until you take us home. I pray, Father, that you would bless the time of invitation this morning. And if there's someone here today that isn't saved, that they would come and trust Christ as their Savior. And Lord, if there are folks here this morning that are raising young people or have grandchildren 
or that they would find themselves praying for themselves, but also for their children and grandchildren that are coming behind them. God, you would help them to be strong and stand firm. Perhaps many have some children and grandchildren who don't even know you, Lord. May it be their determination to be able to share Christ with them and bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Lord, do a work. Help us to be strong. Lord, there may be someone here facing a challenge even in the workplace to capitulate to a culture, Lord, that's not godly. I pray, Lord, that you give them faith to stand. Lord, help us today in this invitation, we pray in Christ's name. So, Brother Pearson, as you lead us this morning, if God has spoken in your heart, maybe just in a trip to the altar this morning, if God is speaking to you to pray and ask God to help. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your goodness. Thank you for the decisions that have been made this morning. Lord, thank you for our preacher this morning. Pray that you bless him. Thank you for his heart for souls, for his heart for the church, for his heart for our church family. And Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, just give him your mind tonight as he prepares for the service this evening. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us, Lord, as we uh, continue in this culture, Lord, that is so diametrically opposed to everything that, that we believe and that your word teaches. Lord, may we have the faith uh, to stand up, stand firm. Give us the right demeanor, the right um, approach, Lord, as we deal with others. And Lord, as we are a light, and as we stand firm for you, would you allow your spirit to work through us to draw others to you for saving knowledge and Lord, a change in their lives. Thank you for our church family. I pray that you bless us here as we go in just a few moments. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. You can remain standing. We will actually, no, go ahead and be seated. I forgot we do have one other thing that we will do. I apologize for that. Uh, We'll show you what's coming up next. We'll make just a couple of brief comments and we will be done with our service. Thanks for joining us as we take a look at some upcoming events and connection opportunities for you and your family here at Franklin Road Baptist Church. Not only is Vacation Bible School the biggest event of our FRBC Kids Department, but it is also the biggest outreach opportunity of the year at our church. Monday morning through Wednesday morning, kids from our church and across the community will come together to enjoy fun games, exciting activities, and challenging lessons from God's Word. Then on Wednesday evening, VBS concludes as our midweek service is transformed into an exciting event for kids and adults alike during our annual Community Family Night. This is a completely free event, but be sure to register your child for this year's Vacation Bible School online at frbc.com. Patriotic Sunday is one of the highlights of the year at FRBC. During this service, we place a special emphasis on God and country by honoring our veterans and reflecting on the biblical principles that have made this nation great. This year, we are privileged to have the founder of the Christian Law Association, Dr. David Gibbs Jr. as our special guest speaker. 
Begin now inviting friends, family, and veterans for Patriotic Sunday at Franklin Road Baptist Church. Sometimes going to church can cause you to feel lost in a crowd or like you just don't belong. We help you to find authentic relationships by offering a variety of ways for men, women, singles, and couples of all ages to make genuine connections in a similar group setting. We have activities and events this month specifically designed to help you get to know others and make genuine connections that could last a lifetime. Visit our website to learn more and get involved with upcoming opportunities at our church. You can learn more about our church by connecting with us online or stopping by the information desk. If you are new to our church, remember to complete your connection card and bring it to the welcome area after the service where our pastor and his wife look forward to presenting you with a free gift. We look forward to seeing you again soon right here at Franklin Road Baptist Church. All right, and don't forget about the book man. Brother Harrison will be out there and you can uh, look through those books and hopefully get some good literature to increase your faith. And then also, if you are able and willing to help with Vacation Bible School, there's a sign-up sheet at the information desk. We'd love for you to sign up to help with them just during the morning hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of uh, June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. We need help. We certainly do. We made an announcement last week, still need help. And so if you could look at your schedule and possibly help, that would be a wonderful thing. Would you stand with me? And let's sing together our chorus for this morning. God is so good. He's so good to me. Sing it together. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to I hope you believe that. Well, have a wonderful afternoon. We hope to see you tonight at 6.30. Brother Folger will be back preaching for us again tonight. We look forward to hearing more from the Word of God. Choir practice starts at 5 o'clock. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.